Education program. We've, uh, we've been making our way through the big themes of our church tradition. Uh, you know, we started with the Divine Liturgy, and we moved on to talk about the great feasts of the church. Last year we discussed the sacraments. And so this year I was looking for a topic, I was thinking about it, and I said, what better topic for the Church of Panagias than to talk about the life of the Virgin Mary, her significance, uh, what she means to us really as a church, uh, and what she teaches us about uh, her Son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the title of this series is going to be called Full of Grace, the Life of the Virgin Mary. Full of Grace is what uh, the Archangel Gabriel uh, calls Panagia when he comes for the Annunciation to tell her that God has chosen her to be the mother of, of Christ. So uh, he calls her Full of Grace, and so that will be the title of our, our lecture series this year. Uh, not only that Panagia is full of grace, but through her and her son, that we also become full of grace as well, through her prayers and intercessions. So I have here, uh, this is a hymn, it's called the Axionestin in Greek, uh, and, and it's a beautiful hymn dedicated to the Panagia. We use it in many services. Uh, it's read during the Compline service, it's chanted during the Paraklesi service, we chant it during the liturgy on most liturgy days, uh, and so it kind of encapsulates uh, our our, our position, our attitude toward the Virgin Mary, uh, how we honor her. And uh, so I just wanted to include it here to kind of kick us off, to kind of nudge us uh, as we begin our, our journey. So the hymn, uh, the, the story of this hymn, actually there's a, there's a miracle story associated with this hymn, which is that on, in a church on Mount Athos, the monastic community on Mount Athos, the monks were, were chanting uh, hymns to the Virgin Mary. And they had a strange visitor who came to visit their monastery. And he came and he said, oh, uh, this, let me teach you the way that we chant um, hymns to the, the Virgin Mary where I come from. And this is the hymn that he chanted. And they thought it was so beautiful uh, that they wanted him to write it down for them so that they could chant it in their own monastery as well. And so the monk, uh, the visiting monk, the stranger that had come in, took a tablet, like a, like a rock basically, a stone tablet, and you, you do, using his fingers, inscribed the, the hymn, the Axionistine hymn, and then disappeared. And so this was an angel, actually, of the Lord who had come and had visited this monastery. And so this is the hymn our tradition states, the story goes, not only from uh, our own mouths and our own minds and hands, but from heaven itself about the Virgin Mary. So this hymn uh, goes, Truly you are worthy to be blessed, Mother of our God, the, the Theotokos. You, the ever-blessed one and all blameless one and the mother of our God. You are honored more than the cherubim, and you have more glory when compared to the seraphim. Cherubim and seraphim are angels. They're ranks of angels. So Panagia is glorified and honored more than the angels. You, without corruption, did bear God the Logos. You are the Theotokos. You do we magnify. So the first question, today we're going to just kind of do a light introduction to the topic. Why study it? You know, where, do our, where does our information come from? 
we'll, we'll use a, a little bit of a historical case study to kind of dive a little bit deeper into some of these things that we'll introduce today. And we'll start her actual life uh, in, the next, in the next lecture. But I wanted to kind of get into this question first of why, why study Mary, besides the fact that she's interesting, she has an interesting life. Um, you know, she's everywhere in our churches. If you, if you walk in, she's like one of the first people that you notice and icons uh, throughout the church. Um, but besides that, why study the Panagia? Why study the life of the Theotokos? And so there's a few important reasons, if you ask me, why the Theotokos is a good subject matter for a group like ours in a parish setting, um, coming to learn more about our faith. And the first thing is that the Panagia is a, 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 the greatest, besides Christ, the greatest role model or example of the Christian life, of being a human, really. Uh, St. Ambrose of Milan, I have a little quote here, uh, and I, I passed around the sheets earlier, if you haven't gotten one, I don't know if we have extras, with all the quotes on today's lecture. But uh, St. Ambrose of Milan, who was a church father from the past, writes, Mary's life is a rule of life for all. So, in other words, that the life of the Virgin Mary is kind of, is the bar, is the standard, is the gold standard, so to speak, of, of, of life. And in her life, she exhibits uh, great faith, humility, obedience to God, uh, prayer, purity, among other things. Uh, and we'll see that, we'll, uh, I won't go in, into it right now, but we'll see it as we go through our lectures and, and, and throughout her life. We'll see all of these themes and all of these virtues in the Panagia uh, come out again and again. So the first reason why I think it's important to study the life of the Virgin Mary is because she sets a good example for us. And it's good to know that example uh, so that we can do our best, even though we're broken sinners, to, to follow it and to follow the life of Christ. Uh, another reason why it's important is that Mary, the Panagia, is the starting point of the story of, of salvation, of the divine economy, as we say. Uh, understanding who she is, who the Panagia is, and what she did will help us to understand what is happening in the Bible, to understand what the gospel is about, to understanding our salvation. Uh, you know, her, I have the icon here of the Annunciation, uh, her acceptance of, of God's uh, basically calling her to be the mother of, of our Lord really was the catalyst, was the starting point for the whole for the whole movement. And one thing, uh, the movement towards salvation. So, and one of the th interesting things about our church and how the calendar year is set up, and I, I've probably mentioned this before, but is that September 1st is the new year, the ecclesiastical new year. The first feast of the year is the Panagia's birth. The last feast of the, of the year is the Panagia's death. So in the c context of the Panagia's life, basically, you have the whole story of salvation that plays out through her son, Jesus Christ. So, and it's not by accident. The church did not set that up by accident. The church was very uh, intentional in how it set up these feasts um, to show us and to teach us uh, that the life of the Virgin Mary really is the context in which all of this happens. She's not more important than Christ. She's not, you know, divine like Christ. But without her, without her, you know, what she did, especially in the Annunciation, and we'll see throughout her life as well, um, the, the story never starts, you know. It, the story is very different. So we, we understand and call the Panagia uh, even the new Eve. A lot of our, our church theologians talk about the new Eve and just how Eve's disobedience in the garden, and, 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 at, well, and Christ is the new Adam, but we'll focus on Eve. Eve's disobedience in the garden and, her, and their sin in the garden, Adam and Eve, are undone by Panagia and Christ. Uh, that Panagia is obedient where Eve failed to be obedient. That Panagia follows God's commands where Eve uh, uh, turns away from them. Just like how Christ undoes basically the transgressions of Adam. So we have this very clear vision of Panagia as one of the central roles and figures in the story of salvation. And then I just mentioned this here, the Nestorian controversy. We're going to talk about that at the end. I wanted to kind of plant the seed here. Uh, we'll talk about what that is and, and uh, how this was challenged. This vision of Mary uh, was really challenged uh, early on in church history, and it still is even to today. The last reason I think why it's important to study Panagia is that the Panagia always, 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 always points and directs and leads us to her son, to Christ. And this icon actually is called the Odigitria icon. Panagia has a million icons, and they all have different names. 
And they're all, she's always doing something different in them, very slightly, very slightly different. Actually, if you look on our iconostasi, it's another version of the Odihitria icon of Panagia. Maybe as you leave, take a look at it. But in this icon, Panagia is literally pointing at Christ. Uh, and Odihitria, Odigos in Greek, in, in the, the Greek word Odigos means uh, a guide, someone that is, you know, taking you somewhere. Uh, now it's like, it can even be like a driver in the modern Greek, or the ghost, you know, the, the, the bus driver or something like that. Someone who's taking you to some place. Uh, in this case, it's not some place, but to someone. The Panagia is always constantly pointing us and directing us to Christ. And I think this is a beautiful, this icon is a beautiful example uh, of that theology. And she's constantly interceding to Christ on our behalf. Meaning she's taking our prayers. When we pray to Panagia, we're not, we, when we say, uh, you know, most Holy Theotokos, save us. We're not asking her to, to save us of her own power because she's just human like we are. She's not divine in any way. But what we are asking her to do is to take our prayers to Christ because it is through Christ that um, our salvation comes. So she's constantly interceding and taking our prayers to her son that he can hear them and uh, act for our salvation. Father Anthony Canieris, I, I was reading this uh, yesterday and I thought it was beautiful, so I wanted to include it. He says, summarizing what the Orthodox Church believes about the Theotokos, we may say that the Virgin sits in the first pew, leading us in our prayers to her Son. Her whole life and purpose are simply to bring us to Him. So we view Panagia really as one of us. And that's how we view all the saints and, and even Christ Himself, is that we're all one family. You know, we, we don't have a distinction between heaven and earth. In my homily today, I talked about that, about how in the church, heaven and earth come together. Well, in our church family, it's not only us that are alive on earth, it's also the saints. It's also Panagia and Christ. And that's why in our churches, we have icons everywhere, right? They're with us. The saints are right next to us. Panagia and Christ are right in front of us. And it's done again intentionally to show that we're all together. So in this, in this little illustration that Father Anthony's giving here, uh, we can see Panagia sitting in the first pew. You know, she's leading the prayers um, to Christ. You know, Christ is the, is the priest, the high priest in the altar, and Panagia is in the first pew, leading us in, in, her, prayers, uh, in her prayers to her son. So she's constantly bringing us closer and closer to him. So I hope that through these lectures, through learning more about her, about her life and what she means for us, that we will ultimately grow closer to Christ. Because that's what the purpose of the church is. That's what our salvation is. It's to grow closer to Christ and to be united to Him. So, sources on the life of Mary. So I think it's important to know, as Orthodox, where our sources for the Panagia's life come from, or where the sources really for anything come from. Because uh, in, in our modern day times, uh, we hear some very crazy things. We hear some things that may be shocking to us as Orthodox Christians about Panagia, about Christ, you know, things that people may say. People, things that people even say are ancient traditions that are true and there's these ancient documents and blah, blah, blah. Well, I think it's important to know what the authoritative sources are in the eyes of the church and what are not. So I wanted to include this section here about basically where I'm pulling the information from so that you're aware and so that, you know, when you talk to uh, people, because I know you all have theological discussions in your friend circles, uh, you can know where these, where these information comes from and that it's valid and it has authority. So the first source is, of course, the scriptures, right? The Bible. But the, the Panagia appears in the Bible at, at several different points. Uh, she's at the Annunciation, of course, the Nativity, where Christ is born, Christ's presentation in the Temple. She's at the Wedding of Cana. She's at the Cross. Uh, there's a few other spots where she pops up. Uh, Christ, as a young boy, uh, you know, they go, to, they go to Jerusalem to worship in the temple for Passover, I believe, and Christ stays behind. And there's the story of Panagia and Joseph r running back to Jerusalem to find him. There's a story of, of Panagia and some of their family members waiting for Christ outside the house where he was preaching. Um, so she, she, does, she comes up a few times in the scriptures. But the Gospels, per se, and the, really the New Testament as a whole, are not really about Panagia. They're about Christ. So it's not Panagia focused, right? So it's not a comprehensive, you know, life. You can't pull the, the stories that include the Panagia out of the New Testament and form like a whole life. You know, it starts with the Annunciation. So she's already like, you know, reaching adulthood at that point. 
So it's not, it's not a comprehensive um, source when it comes to the life of the Virgin Mary. But there are good things there. And of course, we know the scriptures are, are valid and authoritative. And these feasts have, of course, a lot to offer. Some of them, I'll mention that the feasts of Christ, so like Annunciation, the presentation of Christ in the temple, we've already discussed those in previous lectures. So I'm not going to touch, I may touch on them, but I'm not going to go in, in depth about them again. So if you feel like I'm skipping things, you can always go back and watch those episodes, so to speak, on the, uh, on, on, on the website because the old lectures are posted. But like, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the Annunciation. I mean, we'll talk about it because it's like the central theme of the Gospels. But um, I'm not going to talk about that feast specifically. I'm going to talk more about the feast pertaining to Panagia herself. So the scriptures are not really a comprehensive um, story. So we have other sources. For example, we have a, a text that is called the Proto Evangelion of James. Now, this text is basically a life of the Virgin Mary, a short life of the Virgin Mary from, the time, from before she was born until, uh, I believe it's like just after the, the resurrection, you know, and it doesn't, even, it doesn't go even to her death. But there's this, this uh, text called Proto Evangelion of James. A lot of the feasts uh, and the hymns and the icons that we have, which I'm sharing here, are, uh, come from, you know, a lot of this comes from the Proto Evangelion. And that means the, the first gospel, the, the, the pre-gospel. So it's like the prequel to the gospels. That's what that means. Uh, why isn't this book included in scripture? I think that's a, pretty, that's a valid question. Well, first of all, the church is not really able, even though it's ascribed here to James, who's one of the apostles, um, the church couldn't really confirm who the actual author is because it was common in ancient history for people to write things and to say, oh, I am... Peter, right? Like, I am this apostle, or I am this famous person. And they were just forging it, basically, so that their, whatever they were writing would get read. Because if it's coming from St. Peter, someone's going to read it. If it's coming from Joe Schmo, like, no one's going to pick it up. So it was very common for forgery to take place in the past. Uh, so that was one of the reasons. And again, the second reason is because it's not pertaining to Christ. The scriptures, the New Testament scriptures, are all about Christ. They're the gospel. But Nagia is not so much the gospel. She's the context of the gospel. So it was not included in the, in the scripture, uh, in the canon of the New Testament. But it does have a lot of very valuable information. And the church uses it uh, in its feasts. We, we see it used very, very clearly in its feasts. Um, we have stories like here we have the, uh, the presentation of the, Pan or the uh, Panagia entering the temple, which we celebrate on November 21st, for example. Is celebrated is in the Proto Evangelion of James. We have here. I put a picture of uh, Joseph, the betrothed. So the story of Joseph and Panagia's betrothal, for example, is in the Proto Evangelion of James. And we see Joseph as an old man because in the Proto Evangelion of James, it tells us that Joseph, at the time he was betrothed to Mary, was old. He was a widower. He had already had his family, and he was basically being being betrothed to Mary to protect her because at that time. For a woman to be on her own was very difficult. So basically the temple chose Joseph. Actually, God chose Joseph. We'll, we'll talk more about that uh, in a, next time. But God chose Joseph to be her protector, basically. And so they didn't have like a married life, like you know normal married couples. They, he was just there to protect her, which stands in direct contrast to some things that we hear from other Christian denominations or people who challenge the validity or the importance of the Virgin Mary. I was reading something... Um, I was reading something a few months ago about how the ancient churches uh, insist on the ever virginity of the Panagia because they can't stand to think about Joseph and Mary having lawful wedded union or something crazy like that. When in our church, we even have feasts that celebrate the conception of saints. Like the conception of the Panagia is a feast in our church. The conception of St. John the Baptist is a feast in our church. Well, they don't have this understanding of Joseph as an old man. You know, they, they see Joseph and Panagia as a young couple, you know, like getting married like any other young couple would get married. So, like, again, these sources, it's why it's important to understand what our church teaches so that we know what we're talking about, you know, so that we know when people, you know, combat against our theology of Panagia and salvation, we can say, well, actually, our church teaches that Joseph was an old man. He was chosen to protect her. No, no more than that. Um, so that's why I included uh, Joseph here. So the Proto-Evangelion is an important source. 
Uh, we have also ecumenical councils that speak about the Panagia. We'll talk about that later. The third ecumenical council particularly is important. Uh, we have patristic writings, writings of the saints and the fathers of the church and mothers of the church. We have the divine liturgy, which talks about the Panagia again and again. Uh, with that hymn that I showed you earlier is in the liturgy. Uh, we have liturgical hymns that are dedicated to the Panagia. We have hymnography, which for the ancient church was really how people learned about the faith. People in the ancient church were illiterate. They weren't educated. School was not something that was openly available. But people learned the faith through the hymns of the church. So many, many, many hymns are dedicated to Panagia. Uh, hundreds, uh, maybe thousands. I mean, like, uh, hymns all over the place. You can't get through a service in our, in our church without hearing about the Panagia at some point. So hymnography is really important, and then iconography. And we've already seen how different icons teach us different things about the Panagia and who she is. So these are the sources we're going to be pulling from and using uh, in, our, in our research. There's a Life of the Panagia written by St. Maximus the Confessor I'll be relying on and some other nice books that have been published recently uh, in the Orthodox Circle. So I want to take a second to talk about this holy tradition versus uh, sola scriptura because what I just laid out for you guys of the sources of the Life of the Panagia being beyond the scriptures for some Christian denominations would be impossible to accept because they are what we call um, sola scriptura churches. They only, for them, the only authoritative source on anything is the Bible. Anything from outside the Bible is unreliable and therefore can't be used. So there are many Christian denominations that simply reject anything outside of the Holy Scriptures, um, which is why we have a lot of times this disagreements between our churches. What we have, what our church teaches, uh, is what we call holy tradition. So we'll talk about that a little bit. So the question is, can we use sources other than the Bible? Is, is Father Dimitri doing something wrong by incorporating these other, these other sources that we have at our, at our disposal? Um, and do these sources have any authority? And what we had mentioned earlier was that while the Bible uh, is the core message, really, of the church, I mean, even the way our churches and our altars are set up, the gospel is literally in the center of the altar table, and that's really where it's like almost enshrined on the altar table. Um, so the Gospels and the Scriptures are, are central and key, and without them we have nothing, really. But uh, there's, it's not the only source. We are able to look beyond the Scriptures as well. Uh, not to, again, not to lower the Scriptures, because that's our first, and first thing that we go to. But we have what is also called Holy Tradition. So let's talk about what Holy Tradition means. And what that doesn't mean, first of all, is making Tzurekia for Pascha. That's not what I'm talking about. That's a tradition, that's a Greek tradition, so I'm not saying it's bad, but holy tradition is something else. It's not dyeing red eggs, it's not uh, whatever you may do in your home uh, or in your kitchen. It's not, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't even know what else it would be. There's lots of great Greek traditions and some not great Greek traditions as well. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. Holy tradition, with a big T, uh, is the life and experience of the church through history. Uh, Vladimir Lasky, who's a modern day, uh, or from the 20th century uh, theologian, he writes that tradition is the life of the Holy Spirit in the church. The life of the Holy Spirit in the church. So for us, the church is not something that happened 2,000 years ago, and now we just kind of like remember it back, you know, back and back. It's, it's a living thing. The church, you know, beginning, beginning with Pentecost, is alive going through the centuries to this very day. And so just like in our own life, we draw from our experiences through time, through history, and through all the things that we go through, so too the church relies on its experience. It relies on the life that it has lived for the past 2,000 years, uh, starting with the scriptures and the gospel and moving into you know, other things. So the holy tradition really provides the context and the lens through which we can read the scriptures. Because many people, you know, if we all were to pick up the Bible and read the same passage, you know, if there's 30 of us in this room, we might have 30 different interpretations of the scriptures. But the church, through its holy tradition, tells us this is how you read this passage. This is the correct interpretation of this passage. And we'll see that with, you know, the Nestorian controversy, which I'll talk about in a minute, how different, you know, bishops even, not even, you know, like lay people, but different bishops are using this same scriptural passages and they're interpreting them in different ways. So the church, our church tradition, our experience through history as the church 
guides us uh, so that we can understand and, and really read this, even the scriptures themselves in the right way. Because we can also read the scriptures in the wrong way too. And that's very dangerous. So what's considered part of our church tradition, holy tradition? So scripture is part of tradition. Again, they're not at odds with each other and they're not opposed to each other. Scripture is part of our tradition. We have the lives of the saints, for example, starting from the early church martyrs and bishops and, and monastics and ascetics of St. Anthony all, through, all the way through to the modern day times, you know, St. Iacobos of Evia and St. Porfirios and Paisios who were canonized in the last five years. So we have this chain of witnesses, so to speak, as we call them, from the beginning, from the Christ and the apostles even to today. So we rely on the lives of the saints to show us, you know, show us what's up. We have the canons of the ecumenical councils, the seven ecumenical councils that our Orthodox Church recognizes. Uh, a lot of them are dogmatic in their nature. They teach us the truth about the faith, and they have a lot of practical uh, things for, for everyday Christian life as well. We have our liturgical texts. If we're going to talk about our church experience, at the center you know, of that church experience for us on, on a, on a daily, daily basis, is our, our lit liturgy you know, experience, our, our worship, our prayer. And so we have these hymns, we have services that teach us about our faith, that guide us down you know, the path to salvation. We have iconography is also another part of church tradition. And that's why icons, you can't just sit down and draw whatever you want. Icons have a very specific formula because they have to be in line with what the church has teaches and has experienced through the ages. I can't just sit down and draw Christ any way that I want. It has to be in the right order, it has to be done the right way, with the right fronima, the right mentality, um, to, to teach the tradition of the church. So these are all part of holy tradition, so we're going to draw from all these in our talks. St. Basil the Great, he writes here, of the beliefs and practices, whether generally accepted or publicly enjoined, which are preserved in the church. St. Basil, he's a, very, he's a wordsmith, he's really good. Are preserved in the church. Some we possess derived from written teaching. So he's saying of all our beliefs, some come from the written word, right? Some come from written teachings. Others we have received delivered to us in a mystery by the traditions of the apostles. So he says some come from the scriptures and some come from other things. He calls them mysteries here and the traditions of the apostles. And here's the important thing. Both of these, in relation to true religion, have the same force. So for St. Basil, who is like a pillar of our faith, he's like one of the foremost of the, of the fathers of our church, for St. Basil, the scriptures and the traditions have the same weight. You know, it's not that one is, is you know, valid and the other is invalid. It's that they both hold the same weight, and they both really hold the church up to what, to what it is. Uh, so I wanted to include this to kind of just nail that point home, is that we're not a church that only relies on the Bible. The Bible is critical, the Bible is our anchor, but there's a wider church tradition and experience of the church that really impacts what we believe and how we live it out on a day-to-day -day basis. And there are other churches that don't, other churches that are, are sola scriptura, and again, that's why sometimes we have some difficulties between our de denominations. So now I want to. I want to. I was thinking of how I wanted. I was going to incorporate all these things we've talked about today in like a concrete manner, and uh, the Nestorian controversy is a great historical example of how, of why Panagia, understanding Panagia is important, and how church tradition uh, really impacts uh, our understanding of salvation and our understanding of, of Panagia and Christ. So this is Nestorius. Nestorius is a heretic, and he is at the time when this is happening, which is in the early 5th century, you know, 400s, early 400s. He's the patriarch of Constantinople. So like I said, it's not lay people only, right? It's not just us sometimes who have some misunderstandings. This is the patriarch of Constantinople. He's the most powerful religious leader in the world, besides maybe the, the Roman bishop, the, the Pope of Rome, who at the time the, churches were, the church was one. So this is Nestorius. And what did Nestorius teach? He taught that Jesus Christ is not one person, but two distinct persons. One divine person and one human. And that at some point, they like got, got mashed together. So basically what he teaches, what he's teaching now, is that Jesus was born as an ordinary man. So at Christ's birth, so to speak, he's just a guy. He's just a baby. He's not, he's not a God-man. He's just a man. But because of his holy life, Jesus was very holy, uh, he was bestowed at some point with divinity. So we have these two people kind of like being, again, kind of Siamese twinned together, right? Now they're, now they're one. 
So his further point, and how Panagia comes into this, is that he taught that the Panagia should not be called Theotokos, which means the God, the one who gives birth to God, but Christotokos, meaning the one who gives birth to Christ. Basically taking the divinity out of, out of the Panagia's conception and all these different things. So because for him, she could not possibly bear God in her womb. How could a woman have God in her own womb? So this is Nestorius. And Nestorius is teaching this theology and it's dividing the empire. So, big problem. It shows here, though, how understanding the Panagia in the right way impacts your understanding of Christ in the right way. Because for us, we could never accept this theology. If Panagia doesn't give birth to the God-man, Christ, both God and both man, then our whole theology of salvation is destroyed. Because Christ has to be God and man from the beginning to sanctify our own existence and open the doors and destroy death and open paradise for us. If that's not true, then everything that we're doing is just, it's a waste. Because Christ has no power to help us. He has no authority to overcome death itself. So understanding who Panagia is directly impacts how we understand who Christ is and what salvation is. So, now let's see how it's tradition takes care of a business against Nestorianism. So we have, for example, the scriptures. We have the, the New Testament. And this is a, the passage from Luke that is the uh, Annunciation story. So in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel. Elizabeth is Mary's cousin. Uh, so she, she's pregnant with John the Baptist. So they're trying to give a historical context now of what's happening when. So in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin, to a virgin, pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. So, again, if you don't have the tradition, Proto Evangelion of James and these other sources, to explain what's going on here, you could easily misunderstand what's happening. Uh, the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. Gr greetings, you who are full of grace, which is the title of our lectures. The Lord is with you. And he goes on to announce that God has chosen her to be the mother of Jesus and she consents. She says, behold, the servant of the Lord. So this is the scriptural passage. The Panagia was a virgin. She conceived through the Holy Spirit. And that, uh, you know, he says the child's name will be Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. So that even in the child, Jesus, that he is also God. We have patristic writers who write on this topic. This is St. Cyril of Alexandria who's writing about Nestorius now. He says, if anyone will not confess that the Emmanuel, again, Christ, he's talking about Jesus, is very God, and that therefore the Holy Virgin is the Theotokos, for in the flesh she bore the word of God made flesh, let him be anathema. So St. Cyril is writing that if anyone rejects uh, Christ as God, or if anyone says that the Panagia is not the Theotokos, let them be anathema, which means let them be cut off, let them be thrown away, like totally cut off from the church. To be anathematized means to be excommunicated. So St. Cyril has some very strong words. Then we have the Third Ecumenical Council, 431 in Ephesus, if my seminary training is coming back now. Uh, so the Third Ecumenical Council was about Nestorius. So they gathered, 200 bishops gathered, and they had a big meeting for like two months. They met from like June 22nd until August 31st. They were meeting forever about this because it was important. And this was one of the proclamations which basically, I put the whole thing here, but basically it means if there are any bishops who ascribe to Nestorius, uh, let them be, uh, it says here, let them be deposed from the priesthood and degraded from their rank. So any bishop or priest that aligns themselves with Nestorius will be removed from the priesthood. It was a very serious, uh, very serious offense. This is a hymn. I'll let you read it on your own because I know we're running out of time. This is a hymn from the Doxesticon of the Annunciation Vespers. So March 24th in the evening when we gather for Vespers, this is a hymn that's chanted. And it talks about the Archangel Gabriel coming to Nazareth and how he can't understand how God will be conceived in the womb of the Virgin and how he who's in heaven will come to earth and all these different things. Um, so I'll let, you, I'll let you read that on your own because it's kind of long here. But it's, again, an example of hymnography teaching the theology of the church. And then we have, of course, our iconography tradition as well, which teaches, uh, here we have the Annunciation icon. We have an icon of Panagia's birth. In both of these, you see the Holy Spirit 
you know, this presence with the rays coming down from heaven. You have the star from heaven. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out about the importance of icons with the Panagia, again, icons, nothing is by accident in icons. You'll see the way the Panagia is dressed is consistent in these icons. Even the colors are the two colors, right? Blue and red. Does anyone know what the significance of those colors are? Yeah, so the blue represents her humanity. So, and on the base robe, it's like the basic robe, right? It's on the bottom layer, is her humanity. Because she is a human. She's not divine. She's not God like some other churches would say, denominations would say. Um, she's human. But in bearing Christ, she takes on the divine. Whereas if you see icons of Christ, and you when, take a look when you come up here, you see icons of Christ, you'll see it's the opposite. The red is the base color. Because it's his divinity is the base. He puts on humanity in becoming a man. We also have in the Panagia icons, she always is, at least most of the time, 99% of the time, is depicted with three stars. Two on her shoulders and one on her head. So the three stars represent her ever virginity. So she was a, a, a virgin before Christ's birth, throughout the pregnancy and, and Christ's birth, and after his birth. So those three stars represent her ever virginity. Again, the church saying it again and again that this is a, a, a miraculous conception by the Holy Spirit and that the child that she bears is God himself in the person of Jesus Christ. So out of all this theological controversy and heresy came all this beautiful tradition that bears witness to who Panagia is and who Christ is. And after really the Third Ecumenical Council and the Fourth Ecumenical Council, which validated the Third Ecumenical Council, is when the church fleshes out a lot of these feast days, a lot of our teachings about the Virgin Mary, and all these hymns that we have coming, you know, that were developed around her feasts. Um, this is the time in our church history when these start to develop and flourish and become a, a key part of our tradition. So this tradition, this tradition, though not scripture, is valid, worthy to be examined, and very beneficial for us on our journey to salvation. So I wanted to use this little historical uh, piece of church history to show why, first of all, why it's important to understand Panagia, who she is, and why tradition is critical, where it comes from, and why it's valid. So may, through Panagia's intercessions and through her prayers, um, may she lead us and guide us during our lectures, and may she uh, help us to understand more about her story, about her son, and, and lead us to him and to his kingdom. Are there any questions at this time? Yes, Father. In the corner that you get of the virgin and child, yeah, um, she has her hands in the air, up towards her yes. face. Is there a significance? I, this particular icon, I actually am not sure what the significance is. To me, as a parent of a young child, she looks like, you know, Jesus has been a little rambunctious today and she's really tired. Because again, but that's part of the, t I, I joke, but that's part of the tradition, of our tradition, right, is that Christ was a child. He was a baby, you know, like he, that's a very important theology of the church is that he grows up a human being, like he grows up like a normal child, um, just like any of us would, because he, in going through our own humanity, sanctifies it and blesses it. So I don't know exactly why. You know, I can't read the scroll. The scroll may have something to do with it. Um, I can try to find out. Pafsolipi, the, 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 the one who stops our sorrows. You know, that's what that means. Pafsolipi means the one who stops our sorrows. So I'm not sure exactly why her hand is in that position, but uh, there's a reason. Um, like I said, whatever she's doing, there's always, you know, it's, it's to, to teach something. But I had never seen that icon, this icon, so I was struck, it like caught my eye, so that's why I included him. But. Yes? I just had a comment. Um, for those of us who have been fortunate enough to go to the uh, Holy Mountain, um, I didn't really fully understand the, the magnitude of, I mean, I, I obviously understood the Banahia and her significance, but it wasn't until I went there that you kind of get a really greater understanding for like the reverence and the adoration and the devotion mm -hmm. to this one person because everywhere you go i mean it's it's all about about her and there's so many icons there that are like miracle working and significant and it's really yeah you make it, it, it i was able to make a connection that i didn't have before so it was important yeah. to me so, so basically what alex was saying was that on, on the holy mountain uh mount athos in greece which is the monastic main monastic community of greece 
that whole peninsula is dedicated to the Panagia. It's called the, in Greek, the Perivolitis Panagia, so like the garden of the Theotokos, basically. Uh, and so like the monks there are very devoted to her and her presence. There's a monastery there that has seven miraculous icons of Panagia in one church. So her presence is very much felt there. Um, I will say that among the Greek people, there is a very deep reverence for Panagia, very deep reverence. You know, you have like island of Tinos, which is basically devoted to her. You have Panagiria around her feast. They are like, you know, celebrated widely. That's why it's called in, in Greece, you know, Panagia's feast day, which is a big day for us because it's our parish. But that's like, it's like a second Pascha. I mean, for them, it's like a big celebration. So I will say that really throughout Greece and the Orthodox world in general, um, people really love Panagia. And I think it goes back to that, you know, the point that we made about the experience of the church and all the things that she's done throughout history and all the prayers that she's answered and all the miracles that she's worked on our behalf. I mean, even like in our modern day times, like miracles from like World War II, where she like comes and saves villages from the SS. I mean, like she's, her, she's like ever present in our, when our prayer, when we offer prayers to Panagia, she, she makes it happen, um, as long as it's for our salvation. So I think that's really where it comes from. And for the monks of Monothos, you know, obviously they have a special connection with her as well. But it's important for each of us to foster our connection with Panagia because she connects us to Christ. So any other questions before we depart for the day? All right, thank you. Thank you all for joining. And uh, may God bless you and Panagia be with all of you. <laughs> Και προστασίες θα μετάχθε τον ελπίδαν Τάφος και νεκρώσεις φουν και κράτησεν Ως γαρ ζωής μητέρα προς την ζωή μετέστησεν Oh, Mitra Nikisa.